In this session, we are concentrating in the place of nuclear energy within the whole energy mix. And like we heard many times before, there are already existing technologies, as well as new innovation technologies, and they together build flexible and diverse systems, uh, with which uh, fulfill ever increasing energy needs and help us meet the targets for mitigating the climate change. Uh, however, how we, like, we heard yesterday that uh, there's a huge risk that the capacity of nuclear energy is decreasing in the future, uh, especially in Europe, uh, because more power plants are dismantled and the new ones are built and they are ready for operation. So new facilities and new technologies are definitely needed uh, in order to get more clean energy. So in this panel, these both issues are actually very well presented. There are two new build projects in Finland and new production capabilities planned in Bulgaria. And of course, there are SMRs which represent the new technology. So first I want to introduce the members of our roundtable. So in this panel we have today Tuomo Huttunen, who works as a PR manager at Venoema. Then we have Juppe Marino, who is the executive director at Kosodui Nuclear Power Plant. And Juha Poikola, manager in public relations and responsibility at TVO. And then uh, Andre Rosevin, sorry, I, I can pronounce your name a bit faster. Right. <laughs> uh, he's the director of Rosatom Western Europe. And Pek Kasal, there is missing. I guess we, we should have Pekka also, but I, I didn't see. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes, we, we will continue without him. Uh, and then there is Petteri Tiipana, who is a general director of STUK, uh, who is Finnish Radiation Nuclear Safety Authority in Finland. So, uh, about this uh, order in which I will ask the questions and have the uh, panelists to, to allow to speak. I will change a little bit the order. So we will start with Mr. Tipana first, and then we'll continue as it follows at the agenda. So, Stuk has uh, granted the operation license for Olga the Tree, uh, which makes Finland as a pioneer. Uh, so I have actually three questions related to the new plans and the regulations. So, does this being pioneer means that the uh, cooperation needs to be increased, which means that uh, Finland needs to cooperate more with the countries that have the similar power plans, that means UK, France and China. And uh, can all the lessons learned from these new build projects can be contributed to the other countries, uh, especially new built countries like uh, Bulgaria and Poland would benefit much from these experiences. And the last one, Stuk is also a member on ENTREC. How do you see? Should we standardize the security norms for every different type of technology in order to speed up the ease the license processes? As we discussed yesterday, uh, many power plant projects are late, so could standardization help the licensing processes? Good, good morning. <coughs> uh, thank you, Marit, for, for the questions and, and also for adjusting the order of, of speakers. I'm, I'm very sorry, but I have to leave soon after my speech to another meeting which is outside of my control. So I have to be there. Uh, first of all, Stuk did not grant the license. We are not the licensing authority. It's the Ministry of Employment and the Economy. But we, of course, did conduct safety evaluation, which is part of the <coughs> licensing process in Finland. But anyhow, the question, of course, is still valid. Uh, but the pioneering and, and particularly the cooperation between the countries which uh, are evaluating and licensing a similar design and uh, as you said uh, it is a must uh, to cooperate because we can learn and share and uh, use our resources in 
much more effective way by, by, by cooperating than just working alone. And this has been the case with the EPRs. It started in, I think, in 2000, even earlier, but when I came uh, in, it was in 2003, and then we had quite strong bilateral cooperation with the ASN, or it was not the ASN, but former French regulator. <clears throat> and it started to evolve from there. Then the US soon participated in, in the cooperation. And then around those times, uh, the countries which were uh, thinking of building new nuclear started to, to discuss should we cooperate more and, and, and how to do that. And at the time, the OECD NEA, or under the umbrella of the NEA, a MDEP pro program was established. It's a multinational design evaluation program, which uh, uh, created a framework for the countries to cooperate. And in, in that framework, we have had, I think, five design-specific working groups. One of them was EPR. Now we have VVER working group. We have had the Korean design APR 1400. We have had the boiling water reactor working group. And now we have uh, Hualong the HPR 1000 working group, and, and of course we had AP 1000, so it's even more than five. But the countries who were licensing or were planning to license these designs uh, got together and had cooperation in different areas. For the EPR, we had the main working group, which shared knowledge on the licensing process, the licensing or safety assessment findings, uh, later on construction experience, and. Uh, construction oversight experience, and now, of course, the commissioning uh, experience. <clears throat> I counted some time when I was chairing the MD, uh, this EPR working group. We had almost 100 people from four or five countries working together. So it's a sort of a small organization uh, working together. And we had specific task groups for INC. We had civil accidents, the PRS, and uh, and transits and accidents, and then some ad hoc groups in different areas in which we shared knowledge. We tasked them to work on the problems to find uh, common uh, positions for regulators, and all these common positions, for instance, are documented uh, in the EPR working group and in the MDEP, MDEP library. And now we have been discussing how to publish them, which can be published, which is not proprietary information. For, and, and of course, which could be used by other <laughs> countries, uh, other regulators uh, who want to or uh, have to license uh, an EPR. So it's there, and there are other documents as well, tec technical documents, which can be used. And uh, with regards to, with regards to the future of the EPR working group, as uh, as you know, the EPRs are soon online in China. They already are. Is Unit 1 and uh, uh, in Finland soon, France follows a little bit later, but anyhow, now the work is on commissioning experience and uh, now we have to think how to continue or if we continue between these countries and regulators when the EPRs are online. I think uh, that it's, it's uh, something to, to consider because the, the first years in particular will uh, be useful for everyone uh, to share, share knowledge. So that's, um, I'm not sure if I answered question one, at least question two was, was, was how other countries could, uh, could uh, learn from the experience. That's one way, as I said, the documents are there, the lessons are there, the regulatory positions are there, and I think to some extent these regulatory positions, which are there on, on INC, on, on, on severe accidents, Accidents and transients, and, and so on, also are to some extent harmonization because these positions are common. We have, a, have a documented it, and it's uh, has been applied in, in, in our countries and could, of course, be applied in, in other countries as well. M more generally, on standardization, um, <clears throat> I would say at the moment. Uh, the safety requirements for at least large light water reactors are pre 
pretty much standardized with regards to the IAEA safety standards and, and vendors safety reference levels. So it, it, on a general level one could say that they are standardized. <laughs> and countries are of course committed to uh, implement those requirements in their national uh, regulations. But countries can of course do more. I think the, the biggest challenge is to fill in the gap between these safety requirements which are on a higher level and then the codes and standards which are in practice used uh, by the utilities, the vendors and the subcontractors. I think there is a gap and this gap uh, results in differences how countries, the regulators and the vendors, utilities uh, interpret them in their applications and that, that at least may result and results in differences in different countries. This is of course just part of the reason that why, why, why these reactors are different, the natural circumstances on the sites and the supply chain will of course result in, in differences as well. The other part uh, about standardization is what we have been discussing in, in Finland particularly is uh, how uh, commercial of, of the soft components could be used also in safety significant uh, ap applications at nuclear power plants and uh, or in a way it's a commercial grade dedication process which uh, is, is used in, in, in the US for instance but it, it's a sort of a national uh, project and this we do in cooperation between the utilities and, and the regulator to see in which uh, areas uh, these commercial components could be used and if there is any additional work that should be done and that the utilities are working together. It's a pilot project which is ongoing and, and we have been providing our insights on that and I think uh, it should be something useful also in terms of uh, standardization in a way from a different angle to use standard components also in, in safety classified uh, applications. And you are referring to NSREC, we are meeting tomorrow uh, and um, one of the items is SMRs and standardization which I think is even, even more significant for the SMRs to be uh, feasible. to be used in both uh, electricity and, and heat production. But uh, it will remain to be seen what will be discussed tomorrow. Thank you, Marit. Thank you, Petri. So last week I, I talked with the China Nuclear Energy Association and they really had read your documents from your webpage related to the Oculus of the Tree project and the reasons for delayed projects and they, they knew them by heart. <laughs> so it, it has been a very good document because they have, it is well written worldwide. <laughs> so good to, good to hear that we are able to, to have your uh, shared comments and share views related to the cooperation with the other authorities also. So let's continue to there. Another new build project, which is Fennuvoima's new reactor in Pyhäjoki Hanhikivi. And uh, Fennuvoima aims to have a new power plant, and it's, it's at the licensing phase at this moment, and, and aims to be in operation in 2028. So, uh, like Mr. Karipa told yesterday, one way to cut down the carbon dioxide emissions, or actually get rid of them, is, is to reduce or, or uh, stop consumption of electricity, but uh, on contrary, you recommend that we should increase our consumption in order to do better meet the industrial and economical decarbonization. So that leads to three different questions for you, Tuomo Huttunen. <laughs> so first of all, uh, how do you see that uh, nuclear energy health set us a new system and make energy intensive uh, industries more competitive? The second is that the Fennovema uh, capital model follows so-called Mankalapo model. So what are the advantages of this contract model for your 
And the last one, uh, how about the price for carbon emission allowances? Should we have example minimum price for those? And I have to remind that we will have discussions concerning the Mankala model with the Poikola, Timo, you have Poikola's presentation, so you don't have to go in that deep in that sense. But please, the floor is yours now. Okay, thank you. I hope this mic works. Uh, so basically, uh, as you said, I'm uh, Tom Hottonen from Fennovoima. We are quite a new nuclear company in Finland, uh, established in 2007, building a new nuclear power plant. Uh, and as uh, mentioned, we also follow this Mankala principle as our uh, big brother TVO. Uh, so that we can combine our forces, as mentioned yesterday as well, to construct something so enormous in Finland. Uh, it is only a very few companies that alone have this capability, so we can combine our forces. For example, we have a number of big industrial companies uh, as our owners, uh, big energy and uh, electricity users, uh, but we also have small municipalities own, owning uh, smaller shares in our in our company and those put together we can uh, establish something uh, something of this scale but as for the first question and, and for mr garibas uh, comment yesterday about the electricity use we uh, quite often when we talk about uh, emissions and energy we we end up talking only about electricity uh, even though it is, it is a major part, but it's not, not the only part at all. There's a uh, lot of energy use in the industry, there's a lot of energy use in, in heating and in the transport sectors. And uh, our comment, or my comment, is that electricity use in itself, it, it, is, it is not a bad thing. If we increase the consumption of electricity, it, it, it doesn't mean that we are energy inefficient. Let's uh, take an example. For example, if we some 10% of Finnish households still use heating oil as the main heat supply for their house. Not perhaps apartment buildings, but, but uh, smaller houses. If we replace this heating oil with a heat pump, this will require uh, a small amount of electricity. So the total uh, consumption of electricity goes up a little bit, but the total consumption of energy and especially emissions goes down dramatically. So if we replace fossil fuels in other sectors with electricity, this is not a bad thing. Of course, we need to keep in mind that the electricity use has to be efficient. We, we don't want to keep all of our uh, doors and windows open uh, in this weather or in the, in, the, in the north, especially whether there's the proper winter. But in itself, electricity is not bad. And another uh, bigger example is one of our major owners is SA SSAB, which is a steel producer in, in, uh, in the, let's say, in the north or in the middle of Finland. It is one of the biggest uh, single sources of CO2 as well in Finland. And it's, it is not in the electricity sector that they use energy. They, of course, they need that as well, but a lot of the energy comes from uh, fossil fuels. And now SSAB has a project where they study the possibility to replace fossil fuels with hydrogen in steel production. But to manufacture hydrogen, they need an enormous amount of electricity. More or less one uh, entire big nuclear power plant is needed just to replace all of this, uh, uh, just to produce all of this uh, hydrogen. But if the result is that the total consumption of energy goes down dramatically but is replaced with increased electricity consumption. Again, this is good for the environment. In often the, the case is that electricity is a lot more easier to decarbonize compared to other, uh, other sources. And then uh, let's take even another example. In Finland we have some two and a half million passenger cars which on average drive about 15,000 kilometers uh, per year. And if we replaced all of this with the flick of a switch with electric cars, uh, which consume some uh, 150 watt hours of electricity per, uh, uh, per kilometer, this will result in total electricity consumption of roughly nine terawatt hours. This is one uh, 1200 a megawatt nuclear power plant running at 90% uh, capacity factor. So we increase our electricity consumption by 9 terawatt hours if we do this, 
but the total consumption of energy and especially emissions and pollution at the same time goes down dramatically. So it's, it is not a, a black and white uh, situation uh, as far as the electricity uh, goes. And another good thing here is uh, you mentioned the uh, carbon allowances or carbon pricing. Our view on the market situation is that we believe in the ETS system, uh, the emissions trading system, that this is a, a fair and a good way and a working established way to uh, cut down carbon uh, emissions. But of course the problem has been that the cost of CO2 has been way too low. Now the system is uh, recovering to better uh, put forward the CO2 free uh, electricity uh, sources. But even though the cost of carbon uh, in the ETS system is, is improving or, uh, or getting higher as it should, there's another problem is that there's a large parts of the society that are outside of the ETS system. Let's take, for example, heating. Uh, if we uh, consume electricity uh, or energy in heating, it is not in the ETS system. So th that is another advantage of switching from, let's say, heating oil to a heat pump, which uses electricity, because the electricity then is in the ETS system, which we can uh, better control to uh, cut down our CO2. And the same goes for, uh, for uh, the electrification of, of uh, traffic as we move from non-ETS system to within the ETS system. So that, uh, that is another uh, advantage of that. You may have perhaps seen that the share of electric buses in, uh, in Helsinki is increasing. It could be faster, but it, uh, it is still, you can see them on the street. And for example, finally, when we got the extension of the metro line, we were able to cut down uh, the diesel bus lines from, uh, from the west quite, uh, quite dramatically. And again, these are something that moves from non-ETS to the ETS system. And this is something that, uh, that we uh, truly believe in that, that will benefit both the nuclear industry as well as the uh, renewables. So that's uh, my, uh, my comment in, in short. Thank you, Tuomo. It was good to remind us that you always need to look the whole picture, not just partially optimize some particular area. So it's not just the electricity, it's also the use of energy in overall. So let's move to the other new build projects, so Bulgarian Kotelui nuclear power plant and Mr. Lupin Marino. So, there will be new production capabilities in Bulgaria and also there will be continuation of existing power plants. So I have two questions for you. So how to combine the partnerships between different actors in order to share safety costs? And then concerning about the new production facilities, who will guarantee the new build project and what terms are imposed for potential investors? Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank our host and organizer for invitation to be here to share some news from Bulgaria. And also, I have to share that uh, quite mistake has been made because it's not my job title. So I hope we will not be fired when I come back to Bulgaria. Actually, since 2012, I'm, I, I've been leading a, a project company, special purpose vehicle, with a very similar name of the existing plant. But my company is Kozudu Nuclear Power Plant New Build, so we are sole legal entity. Yes, of course, 100% owned by existing power plant, but our, I'm not the executive of existing. So. I don't have any revenue as of my <laughs> my parent company. Also, I would like to share that uh, our main responsibility, my team and I, and to implement uh, first to implement the visibility study and licensing procedure for two nuclear units on the existing site, because uh, our power plant in 2012 decided to 
extend the market share and to invest in, in possibility and of course to invest in two nuclear units. A lot of negotiations had been made with the Westinghouse but uh, for some reason they just stopped and was cancelled. Uh, my company as a licensing procedure is in front of the um, uh, size selection approval from the nuclear regulator. So we expected it uh, in the end of this January, so we, we hope that we'll reach very soon the very important uh, point of site selection. Um, can I say, uh, you may know that uh, Kosovo nuclear power plant had uh, six units in operation, but uh, during the um, uh, joining into uh, European Union, we had to close the four one, the oldest one. Now we had uh, four. Uh, we have uh, two uh, existing VVR 1000, and the good news from there is the lifetime extension procedure just finished. And thankful to our partners from Rosatom, uh, we had uh, we have um, NDDF also, and we have uh, 30, uh, 30 years horizon in front of us. Of course, very recently we received uh, two 10, li uh, 10 years license from nuclear regulators, so we have uh, 10 years to decide what what we will do. The expected uh, profit of a resilient company will be something around 200 million euro this year. It's quite a big amount for us. And we think that uh, next 10 years, if this, this tendency will keep and, and this such a profit or rise it, we can, uh, we can earn enough, uh, enough sufficient funds to, to fund our project. Only to fund only the owner's cost, but we are looking for a strategic investor in some case. Uh, I would like to share that the, the current producing price from the Kuzudu nuclear power plant is probably the most cheapest in Europe, is 25 euro per megawatt, but it is from existing power plant. Uh, I will. I will try to answer on the first question, even even though that I couldn't understand clearly how to share the, the how to share the, the the safety cost regarding to the uh, to the requirements of the Convention of Nuclear Safety. The the safety cost belongs to the operator, and to share with somebody is quite un, don't, un understandable for for us, but. As we know, that the safety has uh, uh, two categories, technology and human factor. And uh, if you invest enough in the human factor, because technology is already made, you can reach the higher safety. But the safety is not in my business at the moment, because in, we are in the visibility study. Um, about, about the second question, uh, let me see, I have, uh, um, as you may know, we have another investment proposal for a so-called Pelina project, but it's not a project yet, it's a still an uh, investment proposal. So our government uh, very recently announced uh, uh, the procedure for attracting the strategic investor, and we have uh, 13 uh, letters of interest that the government received. But fortunately, my team and I, we are not responsible for this project, but uh, the, the, most, um, the most known, uh, the most, uh, in, uh, the very important information about uh, how we will attract, how they will attract the investors is included in the, uh, uh, this uh, procedure. So uh, there is uh, some requirements that I have to mention. According to the announcement made this year, the plant should be built on a fully market, market principle. No investment or no operational guarantees, no incentives, no state guarantees or corporate guarantees, no, no power purchase agreement, no CFDs, no other than market. My private and informal uh, opinion is would be impossible, but as I said, 
I'm happy that I'm not responsible for that project. 